Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Arizona Real Estate News. We've got a special edition today. We're here to celebrate having 1 million views. And we brought in some special guests because we thought by now, you're, you're just tired of hearing from us. So we thought, why not bring in a bunch of special guests? And let's say, and the topic of the day is, what do we think this summer market's going to be? So we're going to be popping some guests in and we're going to start right now with one of our favorite YouTubers, Mr. Dan Frio. How are you, Dan? Hey, folks. Congratulations, buddy. Thanks, the first, pal. It's, remember the, probably the first video you put it out there and you're like, please, somebody just watch the darn thing. And then <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, then you start getting some traction and it's so cool. So congratulations. Thanks. It's, I started uh, following uh, you about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Pat and I did that first video on a Zoom call. And uh, I think... Three years later, we're up to 68 views. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it had that much content. So, um, so Dan, question yes, of the day. And, yes, you know, you and Pat are the ones that follow the charts, look at the rates, look at the bond market, and try to figure out where we're going to be, like, next week, yeah. tomorrow. And everything that you're seeing now, um, what does your crystal ball say, like, What's the summer look like? What what we know what spring's going to be. It looks like it's going to be pretty pretty decent. Yeah, comparatively. So, so you're just trying to get me in trouble, aren't you? Because I got <laughs> blackballed. Well, you and I both got blackballed, and that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you because you give the truth with all this stuff. You know, so many YouTubers are out there saying, you know, the world's going to crash and the market's down a hundred percent and all this other stuff, and it's like, guys, just stop. And then yeah. I reached out to you about a year ago. And I'm like, hey, you actually get it. Let's, you know, let's do this together. So here's here's my thought with the market. So the first thing we want to look at is what's going on with rates. Okay, because that's, that's a big part of the home affordability and everything else. So the rates, here's my prediction. And I follow this. I follow the futures markets and everything else. Is the Federal Reserve in the next meeting, and that's coming up, I think, next week or the following week, they're going to raise rates a quarter percent. Now, this isn't me guessing. This is actually the futures market. You can go to the Chicago Board of Trade, check the futures, and it tells you what the Fed's basically projections are going to be. So they're saying that the Federal Reserve is going to raise rates by a quarter percent. They're going to stick that. They're going to hold. And then about Q3 of this year, they're supposed to pivot. Why the pivot? Well, because of a recession's here, and it's, it's going to hit. And it's going to hit pretty hard in the manufacturing sector. So th that's what I usually do talk on my about my on my channel each day is those things to see what the economy is going through. So first thing is we want to talk about affordability. That's now talking about rates. So I'm thinking rates are going to stagnate right about here. I think in, by the end of the year, my prediction was to be back in the high fives. Um, that's not what everybody wants to hear, but that's that part of it. Now you get to values of properties and you know what my expectations are with housing. And that's really a, a really a, the dynamic of building. So you guys in, in your area, you have a lot of construction. The, the, the supply right now is so dismal, and you guys probably see it, where we need the builders to actually pick up and start you know, building more. And we're starting to see that in the permits. The permits are starting to come up, but new construction finishes are down. Um, because you have existing homes, like, like myself and probably everybody on here, if we have a mortgage, we probably have a mortgage rate of about 2 or 3%. So for us even to move to another house, even if I want to downsize, my house payment goes up. So that makes no sense. So the existing home sales are going to be pretty, I'm going to say pretty bad. Um, but I'm not saying that the market's going to crash because just basic supply demand. You, mm -hmm. have, you don't have the supply and the demand is still, believe it or not, folks, it's there. You know, everybody says, well, when rates hit four, it, it's over. And then now that's, you know, now we're in phase, I think, 18 of the housing crash and yeah. the chiller index came out yesterday and now we're up, I think, 2%. So it's like, where's the crash, folks, if that's what you're waiting for? And then the delinquency numbers just were published today and foreclosures were at a all time basically low ever being posted. So you don't have foreclosures come into market, which is a normal piece of the market of supply. So, again, you don't have the existing homes. You don't have foreclosures. <clears throat> So now we're relying on the builders and that's scary. And Dan, I mean, you've been, you've been in the market, you've been there for many years, right? Yes, sir. And um, I've been, I've been professing too the same thing that you know, there's what 36, 37 million people that are at four, four and a half percent or lower. Yeah. They're not moving. No. I mean, that, we didn't have that no seven or 08, exactly. that cushion. We didn't have that cushion. Yep. That cushion is huge. Yeah. And the 2008, everybody's, 
everybody's dynamics or argument about the housing crash. It's like, why is it going to crash? Well, in 2008, we had so much, you know, it, it price appreciation that it crashed. That is nonsense. It's not even close to the truth. The truth is there were subprime mortgages to people that didn't deserve these houses. Right. And then when the market turned and started, the, you know, that the, we didn't keep getting the rapid appreciation, people's house payments doubled and tripled. Look it up. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, they're, they can't refinance at 100% loan to value because they're underwater because housing took a little turn. And then it was just one huge snowball where people were forced to sell their house because yep. they couldn't make the mortgage payments. Now you're not forced to sell your house. You can sell it and make probably a big profit. But then what are you going to do? Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, on this channel, we try not to predict too far out because even the big guys can it right. And the last time that I predicted interest rates, I had to pass this bet. <laughs> so, you know, my I don't know. we all lost on that bet. I yeah, bet. I, I lost my dollar bet to Pat. So I, I was with Pat on that. I don't know why. Yeah, can I put here question? Do you I, follow Barry Habib? I, I, I honestly, I don't. You don't. I yeah. used to. I used to a lot, and I subscribed to the you know all the channels and stuff like that. And to be honest with you, it got so expensive. That yeah. I'm like, well, I can I can compile all this data on my own. And actually, you, you mentioned that I'm actually working on a version that you and I can afford. You know, what do you need from that? Well, I, you mm -hmm. know, I can give you the MBS. I can give you the comments because mm -hmm. most of this stuff, they're just dragging in data. You know, they're getting data from CNBC or things, things anyways. So I can just put snippets and a blog post on a thing, offer it to people for you know, 10 bucks a month versus, you know, 200 bucks. I'm not yeah. saying anything about it. He's a, he's a genius. Yeah. But I'm saying yeah. a lot of his platforms just, they get yeah, too expensive for the average loan officer. Yeah. 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 I agree. yeah. Well, Dan, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Good. We're going to zip over to other people. And I know you've got a live stream coming yes. up here in like 20 five minutes and you're busy and thanks for squeaking well, out the congratulations time. Congratulations to you, Rick, and all thank you guys you. for the great thank we'll talk, you. We'll talk again. Take care, guys. Thanks, Dan. Bye. Girls. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, we're always talking about data and we are avid followers of the Cromford market. And we, we like to look at it because it's really one of the only sources that we have here that drills into all you can go drunk with the data in that thing it's just so many numbers but the person that puts it all together for us is right here with us today tina tambour from the cromford hey. market welcome Hello. welcome we've actually got uh, the audience here that says welcome, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> but, oh, Rick. you are um You've got a hard job. I don't know how you do it. Uh, you you have all this data and you make sense of it for us. So we're able to go in and look up just about anything we want. But I also like how you don't stick your neck out like CoreLogic or Zillow as well. <laughs> well, I have to admit, I don't do this by myself. So like, I don't want you to think that I'm over here doing all of it. The report was put together by Michael Orr. He's a mathematician from Oxford, and he set up a lot of our indexes well over a decade ago. And they go back to uh, all the way to 2001. So we have a lot of that historical data that a lot of the out of state analysts may not have because we have a arrangement with the local MLS here that allows us to download their data, all of it, every single day. Um, for the real estate agent members of their Arizona regional MLS. So it is proprietary and we are very blessed to have that relationship. And uh, to the point uh, that I heard earlier about, you know, we're not in another 2008 and we're not expecting prices to crash anywhere remotely close to that. One of the things we have that, that supports that is actual 2008 data to let us know what was supply back in 2008? What was uh, demand like back then as well? Many of the reports that are coming out where people are correlating this market to 2008 or 2007 um, are only using demand and they don't actually have the supply counts from those times. So it's real important to understand that we had 57,000 listings in the MLS at the end of 2007. And we have only 12,000 in the MLS now active supply. So while we might be correlating a little bit to the demand side, which is uh, contracts and escrow, 
um, sales volumes and so on. Um, that supply element is keeping the greater Phoenix area in a seller's market with upward pressure on price and, and, and keep it on appreciating at this point since December. Well, where do you see, uh, what's our summer market going to look like? Well, um, one thing to understand about Greater Phoenix in Arizona, but really our segment of housing is our seasons are a little bit different from the national seasons. So we we slow down in the summer. Nobody really wants to be shopping in 117 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's where you find all the bargains that's like you know if you're in uh, I'm Buffalo, New York you probably don't want to be out there you know shoveling snow to go look at houses in the winter right so we have kind of an opposite season so what ends up happening for us is it slows down right around you know starting June but all the way into August we have our low season it doesn't mean that we're crashing. It doesn't mean anything other than, you know, people go on vacation. It's just not our peak season. Our peak season is right now, typically April to May. All right. That being said, we have had a suppressed season. When you have an outside force um, suppressing your peak season, what happens? Like it pinches the hose. So let's just pick on mortgage rates, right? Mortgage rates went up from 5.99% average nationally to 7.1% in about two weeks in the month of February. That pinches the hose on our demand. So our demand was flowing through and it pinches it and then it just trickles out. So when we normally would have been rising from January all the way to May in the number of contracts being accepted, we stagnated, right? Now rates are coming down and all kinds of other things are coming out as well. FHA is you know, loosening up on some of the things. So FHA now has a higher loan limit. FHA reduced their mortgage insurance premiums. They uh, have a lower mortgage rate by typically about a 0.4, lower rate than conventional. And, um, and they also allow more in concessions. So 6% of the sale price can go to concessions versus 3% for conventional. So all of a sudden FHA is coming out now and, uh, and helping people along. And it certainly didn't hurt that that all of those headlines coming out with a free mortgage, yeah, <laughs> even yeah. though it was really only for people who enter stress under financial distress. Yeah. <laughs> May, um, that certainly did spur a lot of phone calls to lenders that were able to uh, communicate the benefits of FHA over conventional right now under these circumstances. So with that and the declining supply, we are losing here about 50 listings a day in the Phoenix MLS, um, meaning that every day that buyers wait, they're not seeing a lot of new listings coming on. We're not listing enough to actually supplement what's selling at this stage. So they may start to feel that that sense of urgency, like they may not get the home that they want. They may not get it at the price that they're looking for. And some of them are getting off the fence. So when with interest rates loosening up, FHA loosening up, it unpinched the hose just a little bit. And we had one of the best weeks for contract activity last week, the best week we've seen in over a year in mean, contract activity. We saw a nice little spike there. Mm -hmm. And so it's very possible our season may go a little past June for people who feel like they missed out in February, March, <laughs> possibly April now. So now they might be coming in going, the rates are what they are. I need to get a house. It doesn't look like they're making any more of them right now. <laughs> so, you know, um, Tina, I, I wanted to show you real quick because I, I pull this off the MLS and uh, and I, I call it seven day moving average. Mm -hmm. And so the yellow line is number of new contracts every week and the blue li lines are number of new listings. And I see that spike that you're talking about mm -hmm. and that we finally came above newly. So we had 3,650 over the past seven days new mm -hmm. contracts and only 3745 new listings. So it's it it looks like yeah. that's probably going to keep doing that for a while. Yes, so. exactly. And of course, that's counting all of our price ranges, including luxury. So if we were to start drilling that down to properties that say were under 600,000, you'd probably start to see a stronger decline in supply 
uh, especially under a million for sure. So I believe our summer is going to see prices continue to rise because that's what our leading indicators are showing us that for the next two to three months, you can expect prices to continue on an upward, upward direction. And um, now as far as whether or not we're going to see a big boost of, of, um, of contracts, we might see it, but they might be limited by the lack of listings. So my hope is that, and I don't predict rates. I think you, <laughs> rates are, <laughs> who knows what rates are going to do. But what I can say is that, that rates bouncing all over the place like they have for the last year and a half, but really recently this year, that doesn't just make buyers stay on the fence and wait for stability. It also causes sellers to wait, to wait for stability. Because if you're going to buy after you sell and you don't know what rates are going to look like in two months when you're in line for that, you may just be looking for just any kind of hint of stability in mortgage rates so that you can get off the fence and make that decision for yourself as a seller. I've got one last question I want to ask you. Will you be able to stick around for a couple of minutes for a Q&A from the panel here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, fabulous. Here's my big question. And then we're going to bring on Sean Shackleton, one of our favorite YouTubers here. Hello, um, Sean. So um, you, you see all these people in the comments section go, well, there's a recession coming and you watch mm -hmm. house prices are going to come down. What's our data look like when it shows recessions versus home prices and that and erasing 2008 because that doesn't count is there well, really much of a dip is or is there any at all if you look at the 2001 recession there was no dip for us in terms of housing so that recession was not caused by housing the great recession was caused by mortgage practices and so housing was the leader of that recession and a lot of the job losses were surrounding the, the industry if you will um, Greater Phoenix was very heavy in construction and real estate and tourism and retail at that time. All of those industries go up together and then they come down together as well. So um, when recessions are called, typically what we see are mortgage rates taking a dive and sometimes very sharply. So I think it's reasonable to expect for um, if they call a recession to start seeing those rates come down. Now, Phoenix at this point is in very good position employment wise to um, to suffer that, if you will. So back in the day in 2008, we weren't in a very good position because we didn't have a very diverse workforce or industry here. But now we have a very diverse industry and it's growing and evolving in the high tech and it is medical and it is um, industrial manufacturing. All of those things have come in to offset some of the loss areas, such as lending, such as real estate related things that have started to shrink because of the lack of contracts coming through, right? So I believe that Greater Phoenix is going to fare a little better than some of our other cities in terms of employment during this recessionary period. We won't be necessarily one of the hardest hit areas similar to what we've already gone through this mind you during covid remember they were expecting us to fall you know during the covid years of 2020 and we didn't in fact we grew and we recovered faster than any other city just about so uh, many of the local analysts and economists here in the valley believe that we're going to be um relatively comparatively stable during this partition particular recession. Mind you, we've already been going through this in the housing market for a year. So it's nothing new at this stage. Interesting. That's uh, I'm glad you answered that because we, I get it in the comment section all the time. So. Yeah, I see it. I know. And in times of uncertainty, I just, you know, I, my personality, I lean into what we know and I lean into the math and the math does not support crashing at this point in price. Now, that's totally different when you talk about the experience of people in the industry. So buyers and sellers, not going to see a whole lot of stress or, or um, problems, if you will. But for the industry as a whole, we had grown to accommodate way more transactions than we have in both listing and sales. So the industry is under stress because without contracts and sales, we starve. Okay, so that's, that's a different environment in terms of crashing 
than what the actual sellers and buyers are experiencing. Yeah, well, I mean, our industry is definitely facing a lot of layoffs and everything. Because, but then I, I don't, I also kind of question the headlines when you see some of the sensationalist headlines that say inventory is up 150 percent. I'm like. Oh. I wish it was up five yes. hundred percent. You know. <laughs> um, well, here's a great prediction for you: by the summertime, it will be negative. The uh, year over year, yeah. it will be negative by the summer. Yeah. Interesting. That's, Interesting. That's not a high risk prediction at this point. <laughs> so we're right. up one hundred thirty five percent now, but we were surging this time last year, and we're declining this time. We're down thirty nine percent since October, and since we're losing so many a day, I can tell you that. That year over year comparison is going to go flat very soon within a matter of weeks. And by the summer, it will be negative. Wow. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, one of our YouTubers that we follow here, you know, we're kind of a nice little community in uh, in Arizona. And that is uh, Sean Shackleton. Welcome to the show. Thank we, you. Uh, it's Congratulations, kind of Rick. Thank you. You know, we've we've never met, but we have. Right. I mean, you right. know, it's, it's kind of. Uh, um, and we, we tried to bring uh, Caitlin McKay on as well, and uh, but she's having a baby. So. Yes, she's wow. having a baby. Excuses, excuses. <laughs> yeah, no. God. So, Sean, you're you're. Uh, tell us just a little bit about your YouTube journey. What made you kind of start uh, your page? Well, um, because I think the information that we're able to get out on YouTube is really important. Um, I think that. A lot of people are getting information. I mean, I, I call them the crash bros, right? That they're just seeing all those. And um, it's funny. I, I actually sent Tina a screenshot of um, what's his name, Tina? On oh, Housing Wire. I, I don't know. The, the guy on Housing Wire that saw one of the guys that's the crash bro. Oh, he said, I would Logan. love to be able to debate this guy, but he will not do it. That was Logan. <laughs> I can't think, yeah. I can't pronounce his last name. It's got yeah. a lot of yeah. So it's just really interesting that they're out there putting out this information, and the people are are you know they're holding on to that, and they really believe that that's what's happening, and it's not. Mm -hmm. It's just not. Well, Jack Jackie experienced that. She uh, she questioned <laughs> one the guy that was saying that uh, you know new construction. He was just he was in a new construction lot and showing that nobody was there, and look at all these houses and at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jackie, you know, said I would love to talk to you and everything, and and he called her trash. Yeah, yeah. And she I, told me that too, and it's just terrible. <laughs> it's terrible because the, the only thing that these guys are looking for is they're looking for views so that they so they make money. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. They're also and he gets a lot of they, views. Yeah, well, and they also all of them just about they all have this product to sell. Like I had somebody on my channel tell me that you know I really like you know so and so and. You know, I, I subscribe to his his reports and I'm like, oh, boy, <laughs> you're getting half of the information. Yeah. Yeah. I have. So so you decided to go out and just kind of give an update on what's going on in the Arizona market. Um, do you look very far ahead or are you kind of like the rest of us that are only going to stick your neck out about three months? Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't like to stick my neck out. I mean, there's definitely times because the comment before about Barry Habib, I think he's brilliant. And I think everything that he said has pretty much come true. So I'm very mm -hmm. much looking forward to May 10th and see how that goes. Um, but, you know, you can only go so far and things change so fast that, you know, it's it's hard to to really predict. Right. And and so I'm I I fall to Tina, you know, and say, what is what is right now and that's the thing that i use for my clients too it's like okay what is right now if now is not the right time for you to buy that's okay because it's not the right time for everybody to buy right now mm -hmm. you can only make a decision based on the information you got in front of you at that, that, totally. that moment totally. i mean you can't you know anything else i mean we've we rick and i always joke about the fact you got these mba you know these harvard experts that i mean if everybody i always say and you probably heard me you know, if you watch this but i always say if everybody was so smart we probably would not have had the 08 crash. Right. Because everybody would have been ahead of that to even out that market. But nobody knew. <laughs> so well, and as it's Tina always explains with the Crump or with the the Kay Schiller, it's like, yeah, we already know all that. Yeah. 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 We already yeah. know that. Thanks yeah. for coming out with a report that's really old and we already know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the yeah, crash I, bros love that though. I know. Especially the last couple months. 
I know it's just, it's just, and I, I mean, again, I just, I feel for the, the public because they, they really hold on to that and it's mm-hmm. just, it's not, it's not the truth. Well, the good news is that finally our leading indicators are matching up with the trailing indicators. So what you get is a lot of skepticism in the marketplace when your trailing indicators, which are going to be anything having to do with sales data, mind you that it takes about 30 to 45 days to actually close on a home. It takes another 30 days or so to actually get a contract. So from the time you list to the time you sell, you're looking at two and a half months. Okay. So the thing is that our leading indicators look at solely what's active, how many new listings are coming on, cancellations, all of that that affects supply today. And it also looks at what's in escrow, which is a leading indicator into where prices are going to go. And then finally, by the time we get to the sales part, it's more like a, a duh, like, okay, we got that because we were looking at the leading ones. But when our leading indicators in January were saying, hey, looks like we're going to start seeing some upward pressure on price. December may have been our bottom. Unfortunately, all the lagging ones from anything national is going to be lagging right off the bat. Okay. Um, okay. Schiller is going to, they on their website state they're two months behind and or a three month moving average. So they're three to five months behind. Okay. So the thing is that now that those lagging indicators, at least the ones we're seeing for sales are starting to show an uptick, they're matching with our leading ones. And so you get a little more um, comfort in that, okay, so those are right. Now we can trust it. Now I can make a decision on a housing purchase. But now Kay Schiller, Kay Schiller is still going to be two months behind us. So, and they're using that three month moving average, which means that it's going to be lagging. They're not going to be declaring the bottom just yet until we start to see it turn up. And it, you know, the good news is we get to predict it, say, hey, guess what? Kay Schiller is going to start up ticking here pretty soon, <laughs> next month or two. <laughs> You won't find out for another two months, though. So I just, I just love. I real quickly, Tina. I just love that chart that you have. The the optimism, skepticism, you know, the <laughs> uh, enthusiasm. I mean, that yeah. basically. I mean, you can look at that chart and basically just watch the real estate market. I mean, you see the the, yeah. the trends. And I and I, I always say, I think, and if you agree with me, but I say you take the data. Data turns into trends, and trends turns into psychology. Hmm. Yes. Yes. And um, the issue is that, you know, you get too many emotions involved in your decision and you can find yourself making decisions that are in direct um, opposition to what the metrics actually are telling you for forward looking metrics. Well, that so, we saw that in February, March of, you know, when, the, when you saw the explosion. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and, but, you know, like I said, I think people are starting to feel more comfortable now that prices are rising. That's one thing buyers hate. They don't like to buy a home and watch it go down in value. They like to know that they're going to buy it and at least for the next few months start to see it appreciate. And I think right now that's a reasonable expectation in our market. Well, you know, Ruby, we were talking last uh, a couple weeks ago about buyers expectations that this information we're talking about from Case Shell and everything's like showing January data. So the average buyer is going with the news headlines and the the lagging data from from Case Shiller. Do you find that buyers are starting to kind of come around and get a feel for where the market actually is now? Or do you think they're still about 60 days behind? I think that <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like they're still about 60 days behind. 45, 60 days. Yeah. Jackie, you're seeing the same thing. I am. I am definitely for sure. And I think the biggest issue that I saw the most with, and I think everybody will agree with this, is when the market started to turn with the sellers and, the, you know, our last fall and and even with some of the agents with the outrageous pricing that they would have. So, yeah, that took them for a while to figure out that uh, it was softening very, very quickly. In fact, when and that's another thing I like with the Cromford data is that you're able to look at the number of price reductions and you know a uh, picture tells a what's a picture's worth a thousand words and you look at price reductions and they're they're way up there you know they're more and more and more but they they uh, were lagging they should have reduced them quite a while ago so Sean mm-hmm. you're seeing the same thing you're feeling like the buyers are 60 days behind in the reality of what's going on today yeah, I think that buyers, I mean, some of the buyers that I've got right now, they still feel like they want to find a deal. And I have to kind of educate them and say, you know, really the only deals that you're going to find is if a home needs work. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then you'll find, then you can probably get a deal. Um, but then they go, well, I don't, I don't really want to do work to the house. I'm like, well, <laughs> then we're going to be competing with a bunch of other people. I mean, and I've had clients that go in and we look at a house and I tell them, I'm like, there's multiple offers. Like, do I have to pay over list price? I'm like, you might not have to be pay over list price, but we're going to have to get pretty close or right on the list price if you mm -hmm. want this house. Yeah, and we're expect. having, we're, I'm sorry, Rick. We're no, having to give, um, the seller concessions are lessening. Um, the VA appraisals aren't coming in. Jackie and I have one client that we've got a tide water on again. So this is the third second time. time. Second. second time. It's the second, second time. time for the VA appraisal Tidewater, but we've had them under contract three times now. So the first time we went out, of con we fell out because their house in Utah hadn't sold. But here we are a Tidewater that we're dealing with again. I'm hearing a lot of issues with appraisers right now from a lot of different agents. And I think the problem is, is that we had such a lack of sales in the fall. And the data that the appraisers are trying to use, it just doesn't exist. Well, they're so calling they're, it a declining market. Um, right. I mean, both and appraisers. It's not. Yeah. I'm seeing, that on, I'm seeing that on the non-QM side, non-qualified. We've had a couple, you know, a handful of non-QM appraisals come in declining. Um, conventional, I, it's been fine so far. But non-QM, seems it seems almost like they're tightening the box because they see mm -hmm. stuff down the road on their end. Is kind of shaky you know the credit's tightening on that side yeah i had um, earlier this year that was literally it was almost two million that i thought there was no way that this thing was going to appraise because it had no master bathroom there were holes in walls it needed over three hundred thousand dollars worth of work and both appraisals came in higher than our contract price really? and the, the, even the lender was saying i'm worried about this because i'm being told from my underwriters that you're in a declining market and we're so not. tina are you hearing a lot of that as well um, I've helped some agents with declining market um, appraisals where they have been, you know, sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. But I believe that a lot of the um, the comfort report can help out with that piece of your of your appraisal. We don't really get involved in what your home is actually worth, you know, but we can yep. at least tackle the declining market and in many of our markets even in buckeye where it's technically still a buyer's market or a, a depreciating market what we've really seen is that the prices have just stopped dropping for about three to five months so there are going to be these sub markets that might still be declining but for the most part um, we now have out of our 17 lar largest cities um, 14 of them are all in seller markets now and they're continuing to move into seller's markets and meaning that they're going to be seeing upward pressure on price. And uh, in going forward, we're going to see fewer and fewer of these de depreciating market tags on our appraisals because we're just waiting for those lagging indicators to catch up with our leading indicators. And that's unfortunately that the appraisers have to look behind them for value. And those are going to be properties that were you know, written on four to six weeks ago. So, you know, with each week, each one of these various areas are moving farther into a seller's market. And what that means for buyers is that their window of opportunity is shrinking right now. Mm -hmm. And to the, Sean's point, you know, and, and Ruby's point, you've got buyers that are a few months behind us. That's just because uh, in general, the general public is very, very conservative when it comes to their housing purchases, and they are more on, on the safe side. Those of us who are in the market every day, working it every day, we might have a higher risk tolerance. But in general, your public likes to see maybe two to three months of appreciation to feel very comfortable that they're out of a depreciating market. So the more we see that. Yeah, no, awesome. nobody likes nobody likes to buy if they think it's going to go down in a couple of weeks. Yeah, hey, Tina, that's the irony of a buyer's market, isn't it? Nobody yeah. wants to buy in a buyer's market. <laughs> they Tina, think they do. Hey, Tina, can I ask you a question? I mean, so do uh, real estate agents reach out to you? Do you actually um, will give information like, you know, I've, I've got this appraisal declining market. Can we, you know, refute this uh, this uh, appraisal? Um, well, I just hope they just use your data. Do they just use your data? I, yeah. I met yeah. two appraisers last week and I used mm -hmm. comfort data and packed it in there. And I think it was really helpful because yeah. the one that we just had, Rick, 
I did not expect that appraisal to come in that high. And it, you know, I am seeing a lot of issues with appraisals. And I think the comfort market data that you have available, which is just fantastic, can really help with those appraisals. Mm -hmm. We do yep. have some appraisers who are subscribers to the Comfort Report. They're not required to be, obviously, but we have quite a few who are, and I think that's helpful. And um, I think it's a good idea to throw that in if you have a chance to give mm -hmm. the appraisers your basis for your price to mm -hmm. nip that whole declining market in the bud right off the bat and give them a, a general chart that shows that prices are flat or maybe even appreciating so that if they're going to call it a declining market, they might want to think a little harder about it at least. The problem is when it's, when the appraisal comes in low, it's always the mortgage broker that it's at fault. <laughs> <laughs> always the real estate agent. Yeah, the real estate agent. Yep. Yeah. We, we like to blame everything on you anyway, Pat. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, I really want to thank all of you for showing up and uh, helping us celebrate uh, that, just that tiny milestone of make, having a million views. Um, which ironically, uh, one of my highest viewed real estate content videos was on water. Um, and, you know, <laughs> that not, not real estate trends or anything, but on water. So that was kind of fun. But, but uh, we hope to be hanging around and uh, do a million more. And, and I thank all of you for showing up, uh, especially Pat and Jackie and Ruby for consistently hanging here with me on a weekly basis. And we're going to continue to do it some more. And Sean... Tina, thank you again. Yeah, for thank you. Thank and you. Success of Fresh Faces. Of fun and let's do it again. And thanks to Absolutely. Dan. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care. Right. Bye. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.